We are now in our third iteration of circles. That's when we ask you to get into groups of three, four, or five. We have studied a book. We've studied some articles. This time, it's a podcast, and we want you to listen to it, and then there's a, a, a guide, a discussion guide that you can work through. Do it at your own pace, whatever works for your group, but I think it'll be a blessing. It's all about the church in our modern time. It's how we function as a body of believers. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that today and every Sunday for the next several weeks so that we can get it firmly in our hearts. Today, we're talking about time capsules, time capsules. And our text is Romans chapter 12. If you'll turn there in your Bibles, Romans chapter 12, very familiar passage, I think, if you were brought up in church, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed <clears throat> by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I like the way the message translation puts verse 2. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. That's God's word for us this day. Have you ever buried a time capsule with some organization? A time capsule? In my last church where I served for almost 17 years, during my time there, the church celebrated its 150th anniversary. And we celebrated all year long. And one of the things we did was to bury a time capsule. We put it in a place we thought there wouldn't be a building program over top of it so it could be found. And it was to be opened in November 2044. I told the people I expect to be invited back for that Sunday when the time capsule is opened. Inside is a church directory, a church roll, some bulletins, newsletters, and uh, also a letter from me to that church. My son, John Mark, said, Dad, you, you'll be 90 years old. You can't go back. I said, I can. I'll be 90. You'll be 60, and you'll be driving me there. <laughs> but in the letter, I said some things about the church of 1994, but I said to them, if you have not changed, if you're still doing things the way we were doing them in 1994, then that means by now you have lost several generations of people who needed Christ. The church has to change. The church has to transition for the times in which it finds itself. If you could live at any time in all history, where would you choose to live? When would you choose to live? I majored in history in college because I love history. So there are a lot of different time periods I would like to live in, experience for a time anyway. Sometimes we talk about the good old days, and what we mean are those days of our youth. For me, it would be the 60s and the 70s. Good old days. And you know, there was a lot good about it. You know, back in the good old days, you could read the Bible and pray in public schools, but was it really that good when Jim Crow was there and schools were segregated and some people didn't have the rights that I had? I can remember vividly, vividly walking into the public library and there would be a water fountain for me and there would be a water fountain for African Americans. There'd be a men's room for me and a men's room for black men and a, a women's room for somebody like Audrey, but a women's room for black girls. Good old days? Maybe not. I'll tell you what I think. I think the best days, 
the best time to live, what I would choose is right now. I think this is the best of all possible times. And so the church in the 21st century, number one, has got to understand and appreciate its time. Understand, but more than that, appreciate the time in which we find ourselves. You know, when a basketball player is past the ball, the ball comes into court, he always knows the score. He always knows the time on the scoreboard especially if they're in the last few seconds of the game and they're down one point. He knows when he must release that shot. He's always got the time in his head. Hockey coaches in the last seconds of a game, when they're behind, they will often pull the goalies away from the goal and have more offensive players trying to score to maybe win there in the very end. Do you know what time it is? We need to be people like uh, the, the sons of Issachar, recorded in First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. The sons of Issachar, who understood the times and who knew what Israel should do. Do you know what time it is? It is certainly an age of contradiction. Contradiction. In school, did you read A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens? Or maybe the cliff notes, anyway, of A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. The opening line, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And he was writing about the French Revolution. Best of times and worst of times. You could say that about the age in which we live. A time of light and shadows mingling. I know you watched the ball game yesterday, didn't you? I'm talking about the Nats game. Yeah, we're all excited about that. I was surprised, though, when the game began in in late afternoon, mid-afternoon in St. Louis, there was a clear line, a line of shadow that fell across the infield. It was clear, obvious, which made it very difficult for batters to read the pitches that were coming in to them at 100 miles an hour. It's hard to see shadows. And there's certainly shadows in our world today. Best of times and worst of times. We've got speed, but we don't have much direction. It's an enlightened time, and yet all around the world there are enslaved people. There's reason we think we're, we're modern people. There's reason, but there's also great superstition. Greater productivity, yes, with computers and the internet. And yet sometimes we get the idea that technology is running amok. Have you had the experience of just casually talking with somebody and you mention you need to buy a new car? And then within a minute, you open your phone, and there are several car advertisements. Siri was listening. If you mention a certain kind of car, I want to buy a Ford automobile, that's what will come up on your phone. They're they're listening to us. Now, some people aren't bothered by that. I'm bothered by that. I still treasure privacy. But it's the day in which we live. They say, you know, that computers and robots are going to take all our jobs eventually. I have taken some comfort, a weird kind of comfort, in believing that uh, as long as there's sin, I'll always have a job. (laughs) But, you know, I read this week, this is true, I read this week that in some parts of the world there are now computers, they're robots, powered by artificial intelligence that are counseling people, quoting scripture, handling the sacraments of the ordinances, and even preaching sermons. I don't like that. (laughs) Just as we need a Savior who is acquainted with our griefs and sorrows, I think you probably want a pastor too who knows what it's like to live in this world, who's flawed just like you are, but who has hope in Christ. Yeah, best of times and worst of times. I want you to understand that not everything that's secular is evil. Not everything that happens outside of church 
is wrong or immoral. These are good days. These are days where we can live full and meaningful lives. What does the Bible say? The Bible is clear. We're we're in this world, but we're not to be of this world. Live in the world, but don't be of the world. And turn in your Bibles to John, John chapter 17. John 17, this is the priestly prayer of Jesus. John chapter 17. And look at verse 14. 17 verse 14. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. We're not to withdraw from the world. We're to engage the world. This is what we're here to do. Not to pull back. Not to get into our little group, our little ghetto, our tribe of people who think just like we do, act just like we do, vote just like we do, and there's never any contradiction because we're all on the same page. It's comforting to be in a tribe, but that's not where God wants us to be in our age. He wants us to engage the world, talking, listening, respecting Somebody reminded me this week that Jesus never started a conversation with an outsider by condemning him. Jesus could say some harsh words, but they were almost always directed toward religious people. The sinners, the tax collectors, those far away from God loved Jesus. And it's a mystery to me. I mean, he was, he was the son of God, God in human body, and yet they were drawn to him. What was it about him? I want to know because I want that in my life. Maybe you'd have to see him to understand it. Just reading words on a page, it doesn't come through as clearly as we'd like. But if you could see him, I imagine you would see a big smile on his face most of the time. And hands and arms extended, they were drawn to him. If you were watching the Cowboys and the Packers game last Sunday you may have seen something quite unusual, or at least some people think it is. Two people that you know, President George W. Bush and Ellen DeGeneres, sitting side by side at that ball game and seeming to have a good time together. The criticism has been raging since that time. Now, I'm not endorsing Ellen's lifestyle, nor am I necessarily endorsing George W. Bush's policies. And that's the point. You don't have to, to treat somebody with dignity and kindness and to seek to be a friend. That's what Ellen had to get on television to say this week. She believes that just by talking to somebody and being with somebody doesn't mean you have to agree with them. We are to be kind to everyone. I think that's right. I think that's the spirit of the New Testament, to be kind. If we reject people out of hand simply because of external things, will we ever have a chance to reach them? We're not to withdraw. We are to engage. I don't want us to be like those Amish folks, those precious Amish folks who believe they need to live old-timey lives and drive horse and buggy. You know, I was thinking about that this week. Horse and buggy, that was modern at one time, wasn't it? They've picked one period of time to say, this is the way it ought to be. No, we don't live in the 19th century. We don't live in the 20th century anymore, though we may be very comfortable with that one. We live in the 21st. Our mission is here and now. It's the world system that rejects God, that we are to oppose. 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world. Now listen to this. Do not love the world or anything in the world. 
If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The word world there is the Greek word cosmos, and it means the world system. The world system that stands in opposition to God. We're not to love that. We're not to get so comfortable with that that we fit right in. No, don't don't love the world, but love the people. We're not to love the world, but we are to love the people, just like God. John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. What, what is worldliness anyway? We're not to be of the world. What, what is worldliness? The church I grew up in, in the time in which I grew up, my coming of age in the 60s and 70s, it was changing, but there was still a lot of this there. Worldliness was smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, playing cards, going to the movies, especially if there was an R in front of them, dancing, ooh, dancing. I broke out of that one. Didn't smoke a drink, but I would go to the dances. Where Audrey grew up, it was going to the pool hall. If her mother ever found out she had stepped into the pool hall, no telling what would have happened. And I don't know if she ever did or not. Maybe, maybe she did. But that was worldliness. Is that the sum total of what it means to be a worldly Christian? I, I knew then, know now some people who don't do any of those negative things, but are filled with anger and hatred, racism and greed and lust for power. No, it's not that. I like what John Wesley, the Methodist, said. He defined worldliness this way. Whatever cools my affection for Christ, that is the world. Whatever cools my affection for Christ, that's worldliness in your life and in mine. We're to reject the world system, but not the people of the world. He sent us into the world. And that's what he says there at the end of his prayer. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them. Sent with a purpose. I have sent them into the world. We're here for a reason, my friends. We, we're not just here biding our time, waiting for Jesus to return. We've got something to do while we're here, and that is to go into the world with the gospel. That's what young life is all about. That's what our church is all about, going with the gospel to bring people to Jesus. But if we prejudge them, and if we won't have anything to do with them, and we write them off because of one or two things that are different from us, we'll never have the chance. We're not of the world, even though we are in the world. So back to Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. One translation says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. And it's always trying to do that, to make everybody the same, kind of a cookie cutter thing. We're all the same. And if we're, we're out of step with the world culture, then, then we're out of step with everything. No, I'd rather be in step with Jesus, wouldn't you? I'd rather be in step with his word, even if I seem a little out of step with the culture around me. Don't let it squeeze you into its mold. But if all you're doing is taking your cue from movies and magazines and the internet and the music you listen to, and and that's where you're getting all your cues, then you're going to easily find yourself conformed to this world. You've got to renew your mind. You've got to focus on that which is eternal. His word, the fellowship of believers, so that you can stay in balance. The, this is a day of contradiction. We've got to be in balance with the word of God and the spirit of God in our age. We must be transformed. And the goal is to be formed into the image of Christ. I want to be like Jesus, don't you? 
I want to be like him. And it's a slow process of becoming more and more every day, more and more like him. So that when the world around us sees us, they think they understand Jesus a little better. I want to be that kind of person. I want you to be that kind of person in the 21st century. Pray with me, would you, everyone? We're going to sing in a moment. And if you have given your heart to Christ in recent days, you've committed yourself privately, you need to do it now publicly. In a moment when we stand to sing, I want you to get up and come to where I'm standing and let me know that. If you're ready today to say yes for the very first time, you come and we'll pray with you about it. If you've been coming to our church and you love it here and you feel like you could fit in and, and you could be a part of something bigger than yourself, you'd like to go on record as being a Christ follower locally, you step out and come and we'll open our doors for you. Thank you, Lord, for your word and for your call to discipleship. We pray we'll be faithful in this time and place as you direct us. Give courage now for people to respond. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and we sing together.